Without further delay, let us warmly welcome Dr. Lafran. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks uh, to Dr. Bot for letting me do a presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about LGL leukemia and its intersection with uh, bone marrow failure diseases. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll have, list my disclosures. Uh, Off-label use of some medications and then a few, uh, few scientific advisory boards. And on the next slide <clears throat> was the first description of LGL leukemia as a clonal disorder uh, when I was a fellow at the Hutch, it was almost 40 years ago. Um, the title is actually interesting. Um, so we established the clonality based on cytogenetic clonality, but in the first patients we found neutropenia, pharmacytopenia, hemolytic anemia, all appearing to be autoimmune in basis. And uh, that's still a common theme of the illness like 40 years later. So on the next slide, you'll see different <clears throat> stages of classification. Um, in 1993 in blood, we proposed distinct, disti distinguishing two types based on whether they were T or NK cell. That was eventually adopted by the World Health Organization back in 1999. They called it T-cell granular lymphocytic leukemia, distinguishing it from a very different disease, aggressive NK cell leukemia. Not going to say too much more about that illness, but it's uh, endemic in the Far East and also in Central America, very um, aggressive illness. And then in 2008, the uh, provisional entity, chronic lymphoproliferative disorder of NK cells was described. The current update to the World Health Organization that's just coming out is going to reclassify this, uh, no longer being provisional, and calling it a chronic uh, NK type of LGL leukemia. So on the next slide, I um, want to go through the strategy of how to make a diagnosis. So uh, obviously, in the appropriate clinical context, of uh, patients with splenomegaly, anyone with cytopenia, patients with absolute lymphocytosis. And then uh, really interesting to us still is the connection between uh, a number of autoimmune diseases, but particularly classic rheumatoid arthritis. So on the right is kind of a flow of how we um, work up a patient. The definition of the T-cell kind of LGL leukemia is established on two findings, having an increased number of LGL and showing clonality. So um, we use a number of uh, more than 500 LGL uh, because the usual number is like 200 with a standard deviation of 100. So having more than 500 LGL is more than 99% beyond normal. Um, on the next slide shows the characteristic phenotype of these cells which are described as LGL. So we all know that um, normal lymphocytes are as big as red blood cells. These are twice as big and they have granules in their cytoplasm. If you could go back to the previous slide. Um, so one way is counting these cells, which is how we did it in the beginning by looking at the smear. Um, more up-to-date is flow studies. And that can also distinguish between T cell and NK cells. The typical phenotype of the LGL leukemia cells are CD3 positive, CD8 positive, and then they express various LGL markers that could include uh, CD57 typically, but others are CD16 and CD56. These are actually pretty pure populations that what are called TEMRA cells. T cell effector memory cells that express the CD45RA antigen. Um, the NK cells, it's more difficult to assess clonality. Um, there are a skewed expression of cures that kind of led people to dis distinguish them from normal NK cells. But it's pretty clear now with genomic studies that most of them, if not all, are clonal. Um, Difficulties arise in diagnosis if the LGL count is not over 500. Um, and that's when we actually will look at a bone marrow if it's appropriate clinically. So on the next slide, um, you see the typical marrow findings. Sorry, next slide after that. <clears throat> yep, 
And so um, these are the characteristic histopathologic findings in LGL leukemia in the marrow. Similar findings are seen in the liver and the spleen. So on the left is a typical H&E staining of the arrowhead shows the lymphocytes that are hard to distinguish. But uh, the classic findings are immune histochemistry on the right. And if you stain cells with cytotoxic markers like CD8, perforin, granzyme, TIA1, uh, shown by the arrowhead, these cells line up uh, and form linear arrays, a term that was coined um, by Curtis Hansen and Mayo. And this is pathognomonic of LGL leukemia that are lining up around the microvasculature of the marrow and the sinusoids. They also appear characteristically in the sinusoids of the liver and the red pulp of the spleen. So um, that's pretty typical of LGL leukemia. And on the next slide, uh, shows the illnesses that are associated. So this does include classic rheumatoid arthritis, and then a number of um, cytopenias, chronic neutropenia is probably the classic one, adult onset cyclic neutropenia, which is extremely rare, but all those patients have LGL leukemia. One of the cases we're discussing today in a typical presentation is pure red cell aplasia. So the most common uh, identified disease connected to PRCA uh, is uh, LGL. Uh, other patients have hemolytic anemias. ITP can be seen. Um, there's an interesting article in blood in the last couple of weeks showing that patients of classic ITP have cytotoxic T cells that are TEMRA that are killing platelets, um, just like uh, any cells are just like LGL. And then there's a big overlap with marrow failures like aplastic anemia, PNH, and some patients with MDS. So on the next slide, um, there's a really nice summary uh, of Neil Young's work um, in blood uh, this year, where they're looking at the um, what I would call the intersection of aplastic anemia with LGL leukemia. They're looking at murine immune mediated marrow failure states. And basically they conclude that the uh, patients of it are patients in animal models of aplastic anemia have uh, oligoclonal or clonal infiltration of TAMRA cells like LGL leukemias that are STAT3 activated. And in this uh, paper, because of the STAT3 activation, they use JAK inhibition and had a complete resolution of aplastic anemia. So this is just one recent article that kind of summarizes the intersection between uh, aplastic anemia and LGL leukemia. For the next slide, um, the clinical summary is that these patients with LGL leukemia are characterized by a clonal expansion of, of LGL that are increased in number. They can have typically neutropenia, anemia. They often have splenomegaly. Uh, there are multiple serological abnormalities from presentation, um, suggesting a problem with B cells. And then there's uh, this profound overlap with RA and so-called Felty syndrome. So uh, we're gonna transition next to some of the work we've done over many years in the lab to identify um, survival signals in LGL leukemia. This is a summary of a paper published more than 15 years ago. It was one of the first papers looking at network theory in human disease. And what the slide summarizes in red is all the nodes that are uh, uh, turned on abnormally and green is turned off. So if you look back down at the lower end on the left, apoptosis is turned off. And this is the problem in LGL leukemia. There's profound dysregulation of apoptosis and these cells are surviving a long time, they're not dying, and they're working as uh, activated T cells. The two major nodes on the top that are turned on are IL-15 and PDGF. So IL-15 uh, could be expected because that's a chronic growth factor for activated T cells. And um, in the introduction, it was noted that our, uh, there's a focus in our lab over many years on sphingolipid metabolism, and that's actually shown on the right, uh, where there's a number of nodes that are involved with um, metabolism of single lipids. On the next slide, uh, 
we first described the problem of STAT3 being constitutionally activated when it was at Moffitt in 2001. And uh, we showed that it directly regulated MCL1. So STAT3 is activated, high levels of MCL, MCL1 cause the cells to resistant, be resistant to apoptosis. But with genomic studies over many years later, we know there's literally hundreds of genes in apopto apoptotic pathways that are dysregulated. And on the next slide, published more than uh, 10 years ago, this was an international collaboration with uh, Satu Misjoki in Finland and my friend and colleague uh, for a long time, Yarek Masajewski at the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, we described uh, for the first time that about a third of the patients um, had activating STAT3 mutations that cause STAT3 to be turned on. Um, the next slide shows where these are located typically when we first described it, <clears throat> STAT3 on the left. So there are a number of mutations, but they're all in the dimerization domain um, that caused um, more ready dimerization and then led to 10 to 15 times upregulation of STAT3 transcriptome, which is already turned on the LGL leukemia cells compared to normal cells. Um, on the right, we, um, because we found STAT3 mutated in only a third, we started looking at other STAT family members. So rarely in about 2% of patients, we discovered uh, this mutation, the STAT5B, somatic acquired activating uh, in dimerization domain, just like STAT3. Um, but it's linked to aggressive, very rare cases of LGL leukemia. This is the first time that STAT5 was linked to any human disease in terms of mutation. I would like to point out one of the mutations on, on the right here, N642H. We went on to show that this is a, uh, a link to aggressive T-cell diseases, including T-cell PLL, but others have also defined it um, as fairly frequently occurring as a global rule in aggressive T-cell leukemias, including hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma slash leukemia, uh, acute T-cell leukemia, and some cases of aggressive cutaneous T-cell lymphoma leukemia. So the next slide um, is an overview of a study we published in blood probably two years ago now. We looked at um, the color linkages on the right, uh, gamma delta T-cell, LGLs in green, NK in orange, and the typical alpha beta T cell leukemias in blue. Um, I'm going to focus on the T cell leukemias and make two major points. So there's this big uh, description or definition of STAT3 mutated versus wild type. And with um, a more uh, focused sequencing, we found that STAT3 on the left is mutated in more than half of the patients with LGL leukemia and about a quarter of the NK patients. Um, the other major finding is summarized below STAT3 and about half of the patients with T-cell form of LGL leukemia have uh, inactivating mutations in a variety of different epigenetic modifiers such as KM2D, uh, TET2, et cetera. So that seems to be a theme, STAT3 mutation and inactive, activation of STAT3 by mutation and inactivation of epigenetic modifiers. And on the next slide, um, just uh, makes a conclusion of different clinical correlates with different STAT3 mutations. Um, because of the registry, which we have more than 1,800 patients and we sequenced STAT3 in about 1,000, we can actually make some distinctions between particular STAT3 mutational profiling and different clinical phenotypes. So um, a couple points here. Everyone agrees that any type of STAT3 mutation is associated with lower blood counts and um, need for treatment sooner and probably reduce overall survival. Although this is still a very chronic disease, we're talking 10, 15 years median survival. Um, what we were able to distinguish is that um, macrocytic anemias that turn out to be pretty typical presentation of LGL leukemia, and we're talking about MCVs in the MDS range of like 110 to 120, are associated with one particular kind of STAT3 mutation, which is uh, D661Y. 
So that was a unique finding. The currently mutated genes are listed on the second bullet point. We went over most of those. And then the pathways are summarized uh, on the bottom. And this does include the PI3 kinase pathway that Yarek Masajewski originally defined many years ago. Okay, so on the next slide. Just summarize um, our thinking on therapy. And um, the therapy is based on the observation that these are chronically surviving activated uh, CTL, and we want to get rid of them. Basically, we want to do two things. They're making lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and then they're actually uh, acting as cytotoxic T cells. Um, all the therapy that currently is conventionally utilized, which is single agent immunosuppressive therapies, such as methotrexate, low-dose cytoxin, and cyclosporin, all act initially by suppressing pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as fast ligand. Uh, in distinction to cyclosporin, though, um, methotrexate and cytoxin can actually eliminate the LGL clone. So this is still to date the first large prospective initial therapy for treatment of LGL patients, which was an ECOG study that um, I led. It was published uh, 2014 in Leukemia. Uh, on the next slide, summarizes the kind of disappointing clinical results. So the overall response rate was about 39 or 38%. In retrospective series, uh, all single agent immunosuppressive therapies were around 50%. Kind of encouraging, though, was the design of the study was that a patient's failed methotrexate, they went on to receive cytoxin, and encouragingly, a uh, significant percent of those patients responded. Um, one of the points of the leukemia article is that we studied a, a number of correlative studies to see if anything prior to treatment predicted clinical response to low-dose methotrexate. And the only thing that predicted a response of interest was STAT3 mutation, but it had to be STAT3Y640F, which is the most common STAT3 mutation and also the most activating. Um, eight of eight patients, small number, but every patient uh, with that mutation responded to therapy. We um, submitted an abstract to SOHO uh, where we're updating this. We sequenced uh, 500 patients and correlated STAT mutational profile, and this actually um, is validated. Uh, STAT3 mutation does predict response but, uh, to methotrexate, but interestingly, only in patients who have anemia. So that's kind of a new twist on our data that uh, is a cor correlation with our registry. The bottom line is that none of these treatments are curative, so new therapeutic strategies are needed. And we can go on and talk probably about our treatment which is current recommendations we summarize in blood 2011, updated a few years ago. Uh, really, they're the same <laughs> as more than 10 years ago, so that's disappointing. But uh, low-dose methotrexate, low-dose cytoxin, or cyclosporin at the doses uh, shown in this slide. We we'll go, go on to the next slide, and uh, we can move into the discussion for any questions and also talk about the two patients we have for presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Lafran. So we have two cases to discuss uh, today. So the so first Dr. case is- Bob, Do you want to summarize the case or you want me to do that? Or how do you want no, to- No, I, will, I will read this slide. Okay. So this is a 65-year-old Caucasian male. He initially presented back in 2009 with anemia and unknown absolute lymphocytosis. He did not have any autoimmune disease other than ulcerative colitis with no active symptoms at that time. His initial biopsy done, uh, I believe at UPenn, erythroid hyperplasia suspected to be related to autoimmune hemolytic process. He had the splenectomy and they found it, <clears throat> excuse me, infiltration of LGL cells. And he had the diagnosis of LGL leukemia Flow also uh, suggested with a CD3 positivity, CD8 positive cells with CD57 positive cells. So uh, he did have the TCR, the T cell rearrangement PCR, gamma rearrangement, and it was positive in gamma. So he had the diagnosis of LGL pure red cell pressure. So initially he started with methotrexate, but he was discontinued because of the LFT abnormalities. 
Then he proceeded with the cytoxin, oral cytoxin for seven, uh, for five months, but he had a minimal response and he developed severe diarrhea where he had to stop. And then he started with the cyclosporin and he had some good amount of response, 48 months of response with transfusion independency, but he had to adjust his cyclosporin because of the LFTs and creatinine uh, elevation where he lost his response. And in 2017, he had a repeat bone marrow biopsy. It also showed positive CD57 uh, cells and uh, his cytogenetics was, was normal and he had a negative STAT3 mutation. So he again restarted the methotrexate. He did not have any response. In 2019, he switched to cytoxin oral, no response. And then he proceeded with the BN BNZ1 trial, IL-15 trial uh, that was at um, uh, University of Virginia. He had uh, received 17 weeks and he did not have any response. So he kept not responding in any immunosuppressive agent because of this ATI problem, he switched to ProGraph. He did not have any response. Serolimus tried, tried, uh, uh, and then in, a, in addition to that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, let me just discuss these cases and then you guys can write uh, any questions in chat. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> so obviously there are increased uh, cytotoxic T cells and clonality, and you guys made a diagnosis of LGL PCRA, which sounds very reasonable. Uh, methotrexate didn't work. Cytoxin um, wasn't tolerated. Cyclosporin worked for a while. Um, switched back and actually participated in the BNZ1 trial that we participated in. That's kind of interesting. Uh, BNZ1 is a, uh, a peptide that blocked IL-2, IL-15 receptor common gamma chain signaling. We published in leukemia, and that was one of my uh, conflicts of interest. We published in leukemia with Dr. Wallman that this was an effective uh, medication in, in LGL cells in vitro and in animal models of ATL. Um, and I went to a clinical trial that occurred really pretty quickly phase one slash phase two, uh, completed in about two years. Um, the publication actually has been submitted to blood and I think it'll eventually get published there. Uh, we're in the process of revising it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only a few patients responded in the phase two portion of interest. Um, one of them was a patient of mine who had pure red cell aplasia and had failed all therapies. Um, so it's actually disappointing that this patient did not respond. Uh, most of the patients that responded, of which there were only four, did have anemia for some curious reason. Anyway, you started on a serolimus and no response, Campaf. <laughs> so you've tried a lot of uh, medications here. Um, Campaf, one comment, um, this comes from uh, the NIH, actually Neil Young's group where they treated, I think it was 28 patients published on Lancet hematology right around 2014. Uh, almost all those patients were refractory to uh, therapy for LGL. Um, every patient that had LGL alone, 75% um, of those responded to therapy. There were four patients who had LGL and MDS. None of those patients responded. Um, duration of response is a problem, um, but several patients uh, were out a few years, but still a, a nice response. Obviously, CAMPATH is quite toxic, which adds another problem to the therapy. But um, my bottom line here is that a typical LGL patient that fails the usual three therapeutics, uh, I do use CAMPATH. Um, in this particular patient, because of the history of PRCA, um, and actually one question I would have was a, re uh, a repeat bone marrow done recently, just to make sure it hasn't, oh, <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, great. So recent workup, still PRCA. Okay, that's good. So uh, no transition to aplastic anemia, for example. Um, I guess it's kind of interesting that the TCR gamma now is negative. Um, that doesn't really make too much sense. Um, 
Okay. So um, <clears throat> I would probably, uh, so if you look at the, you know, longstanding history of RRB PRCA, there's really two major articles from the 1980s. One was from University of Washington led by Jan Apkowitz. The other one was from the Mayo Clinic. Um, basically about a quarter of those patients had definite LGL leukemia and they weren't really worked up comprehensively for that. So the um, connection to LGL leukemia and PRCA is strong. It was probably even higher than 25%, point number one. Point number two, is that um, typically you have to go through a number of immunosuppressive therapies before something finally works. Um, what hasn't been tried in this patient is ATG. Um, and I would uh, probably try ATG. And because cyclosporin worked for a little while, if it could still be tolerated, um, I'm um, looking to see what the renal function is, creatinine 1.7. That would be kind of tricky then. Um, I would probably try ATG though. Uh, other, um, in China, for example, uh, they've used fludarabine as a single agent and have reported actually remarkable success. That could be another possibility. And so I see your next slide has some questions that we're probably talking about. Yeah, okay, so for, let's talk about them. Uh, how do you determine gene rearrangement? Okay, so um, <clears throat> yeah, the first description was clonal side genetics, but that was uh, luckily for me, the first two or three patients that we saw had a clonal side genetic abnormality, but after that, the next 20 patients were totally normal. That was around the time that C-cell receptor was being sequenced. So that is a typical uh, conventional use now. Um, QCR is probably as accurate as southern blotting, so I don't think that's important in terms of most people use PCR now. Uh, there are two main probes, gamma, TCR gamma, and TCR beta. Uh, TCR gamma is a, a marker of clonality. Um, it actually doesn't necessarily discriminate between T and NK cells or other key malignancies. Um, TCR beta is more specific. But I just usually go with TCR gamma. Um, is it important to demonstrate clonality? That is the definition of the disease. Um, but obviously, this patient's had uh, you know, classic LGL in the past. It's curious that the clone isn't identified now. Um, I really can't explain that. It's usually pretty sensitive. Um, there's another uh, monoclonal antibody, it's TC. Beta 1, I think it's called, or TC, TB, <laughs> forget the name, but it actually uses the common gamma chain, common TCR beta chain, C, common TCR beta common, common chain number one um, that can be used as a screen. And if it's clonal, uh, all the cells express that receptor. If it's negative, it's a presumptive um, evidence of clonality because if it's normal, there should be a mixture of both of those. Um, second point is treatment options. Um, so I kind of talked about that. Um, uh, summarizing, I think I would try, so there's some problems with this patient in addition to being refractory in that the bilirubin is kind of high, but that might be uh, from hemolysis. I'm not really sure if that's direct or indirect. And then uh, the LTs are otherwise a little bit high, creatinine's a little high. Um, if the creatinine had been normal, I probably would have gone with ATG plus cyclosporin. Um, I think it's worth just treating with HTG alone. I've had a few patients, anecdotally obviously, that failed everything that had T cell LGL PRCA. Actually responded very nicely to the combination of ATG and cyclosporin or ATG alone and had a nice response for, for several years. Um, B-cell-directed therapy, that's an interesting question. Um, conventionally, you wouldn't think that would be helpful uh, because this is a T-cell disorder, um, but um, there are small series, uh, and actually referring back to Yarek Masajewski in the context of patients with LGL and RA have used rituxan primarily for treatment of RA. 
and um, actually found a really nice clinical response. All these patients though had neutropenia. Um, Rituxan probably could be given if there's an autoimmune hemolytic component to the LGL, um, but you wouldn't predict that it would be helpful in the majority of cases. Um, there are some newer therapies available in terms of antibodies. Uh, those were some of my conflicts. Um, tough to say whether this patient would be eligible or not, but there are new phase one clinical trials going on right now. One is exploring STAT3 inhibition. So Chimera Therapeutics has a STAT3 degrader that's now in clinical trials uh, at a couple places, including UVA. Um, and then there's also uh, two companies working on, really interestingly, I think, on LGL-specific antibodies um, that deplete LGL. And uh, these are made by Dren Bio. That uh, the trial is at UVA. Um, there's been about six or seven patients treated uh, on the phase one component, really no major toxicities. The antibody recognizes a fairly specific LGL antigen called CD94. Uh, and non-human primates, they express, those monkeys express CD94. One injection gets rid of all normal LGL within hours, and that effect lasts from one to two months with one dose. There's another company called Abcuro that has an antibody to an NK-like receptor that's on LGL. That's also in phase one clinical trials. So uh, obviously I always promote phase one clinical trials if the patient would be eligible. So that could be a possibility. Um, how long do you wait, wait to await a response? That's an important point. Um, so uh, generally the immunosuppressive therapies that we just mentioned, take a while to work. So um, if the patient's tolerating the medication well, we treat the patient for four months before wanting to see some evidence of a clinical response. So for example, if the uh, treatment indication is ANC less than 500, say like ANC 200, at the end of four months, we wanna see ANC now above 500. It could be 600, 700. That means it's, means it's working. Um, methotrexate, um, often you can get a complete clinical response, um, but it takes more than a year. So the ECOG trial, a couple points about that is that the responders to methotrexate only received a year of therapy. There was only one complete clinical response, um, mainly because the therapy needs to be continued longer. Um, the second point is that um, after stopping therapy, every patient except one, the illness comes back, came back very slowly. So this is definitive evidence where we're saying this is not a curative disease. Um, the only therapies that could eliminate the clone um, and, and uh, actually get a complete clinical remission uh, with uh, maybe even molecular remission are really cytoxin and, and methotrexate. Cytoxin can work quicker. So within the nine to 12 months of treatment, um, you could actually get a complete clinical response and molecular response to cytoxin. Um, duration of therapy of cytoxin is, however, limited empirically in our hands to nine to 12 months because we don't want patients to go on and get, you know, MDS AML from cyto cytotoxic therapy. Um, those patients will relapse, but it may be many years later. A second round of therapy of cytoxin is usually successful. So that's my approach with the standard therapies. Um, question number five, median time to response, uh, median time of response. So, um, so cytoxin, as I indicated, we stopped therapy after a short course of nine to 12 months. Um, I would say almost always the illness will come back, but it may be many years later, three, four, five years later. Um, unusually, it could come back sooner within a year, but that's a little unusual. Methotrexate, um, because they have a nice clinical response between one to two years of therapy, my uh, general approach is if the patient's tolerating it well, continue methotrexate indefinitely. Um, if you stop methotrexate, as I mentioned, illness comes back. It comes back gradually, but second round of therapy, methotrexate, in my hands, has not been nearly as well as the first round of therapy. 
Sometimes patients don't respond at all to the second round of therapy. So uh, my standard approach is to continue methotrexate indefinitely if the patient's tolerating it and it's working really well. Question number six, ATG, not used really frequently. Um, this is a situation though, pure red cell aplasia, mainly based on um, the previous literature of immunotherapeutic response to PRCA often have to use a number of different agents. ATG could work, and that would be my recommendation for this patient here. Uh, so neurotherapies um, don't have any experience with the agents listed here. We did talk about um, the newer drugs in phase one clinical trials. There is some experience with in the context of patients who have RA in LGL that have received the JAK inhibitors or IL-6 inhibitors. And again, this is uh, Yarek Nasajewski's work, small series, five or six patients, both papers published in blood though. Um, all these patients had typical neutropenia. They all responded to therapy. Um, and there's a current uh, phase I think there's a phase, extended clinical trial of ruxolitinib uh, coordinated through Sloan Kettering. Uh, I know one remarkable clinical response, uh, a patient I had seen refractory everything, who's responded exceptionally well to ruxolitinib. So <clears throat> the JAK inhibitors may work. Um, my cautionary note there is that in the lab, uh, we've explored a lot of these. They don't work all that, so ruxolitinib doesn't really work all that well in terms of getting rid of all the LGL cells in vitro. Um, not as effective as like direct STAT3 inhibitors, for example. But again, there is some anecdotal clinical information that it may, might help. Okay, case number two. Um, so let me review this. Okay, presented with anemia, <laughs> had pancytopenia, Got treated with uh, you know typically plastic regimen, ATG cyclosporin. Treated for the standard uh, response of six months. And stopped responded in six months. Stopped after a year. Unfortunately, relapsed soon afterwards. Um, really no response. So the question I guess is this aplastic anemia LGL back to aplastic anemia. And on the right you see the extended clinical course. Um, 2020 started in the transfusions, now has a really a remarkable erythroid hypoplasia, but increased myelopoiesis, which is kind of interesting. Um, 2021 has an adequate neutrophil count. That's the lowest hemoglobin I've ever seen, 2.5. <laughs> oh my gosh, I've seen patients of four, but 2.5 is unbelievable. Um, Okay, so flow suggests LGL, positive for clonality. Uh, PRCA, again, methotrexate, un unfortunately, doesn't work. Oh, so then there's this nephew that had X-linked disease, had this particular mutation. Um, methotrexate was stopped. Continued cyclosporin, started on orcytoxin. So again, okay, so this is kind of an interesting patient. I guess we could summarize it by an overlap between uh, PRCA, aplastic anemia, LGL. As I indicated in the slide and summarized from Yul Young's work, um, these diseases are closely related. They're probably all caused by either oligoclonal or clonal attack on the marrow by typical LGL cells that are Temra positive. They have the phenotype of Temra, just like LGL leukemia cells. They make a huge number of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, they're dependent on the JAK STAT pathway. STAT3 is consistently activated in aplastic anemia. Um, so these illnesses are really related to one another. I still remember, I didn't publish this, but back when I was a fellow in Seattle, obviously uh, with Don Thomas and Ryan Storr's work in transplantation for aplastic anemia, it was and still is a major referral area for a for aplastic anemia. Patients not receiving marrow transplants got ATG. And I looked at their slides, uh, like 50 patients, and like 45 of them had like amazingly high numbers of LGL in circulation. 
So uh, there's definitely an uh, intersection between all these marrow failure diseases and LGL leukemia. The main difference is that in LGL leukemia, there's one major dominant clone and the LGL count is high. So it could be 5,000, it could be 2,000, it could be 8,000. In aplastic anemia, you have to work hard to find the clone. Um, it'll be there, but you generally have to do sophisticated TCR sequencing to find small clones. And if you actually count up the number of cells circulating, the LGL are small, like they're going to be 50 or 60 or 100. They're not thousands, but they have the classic interstitial distribution. Um, so it's a matter of quantity. But um, with LGL having a huge amount of uh, LGL cells with dominant clone, these other conditions have smaller clones. The LGL number is not as prominent, but they're still pathologically active and killing off marrow precursors. So let's go on again, uh, recent workup. So hypercellular marrow, so now it looks like aplastic anemia now. Um, but with a uh, loss of P53, which is concerning, low, um, <clears throat> somewhat similar to LGL. Okay, so here's this TRBC1 I was talking about. It had the right terminology, but doesn't appear to be clonal based on that. Uh, and the TCR was negative, and the viral Ill illness is negative. We took count extremely low, creatinine borderline high. Other studies, um, fairly unremarkable other than the blood counts. Okay, so questions, yeah, clonality. So we talked about this. Um, so just to reemphasize, the diagnosis of LGL leukemia is one dominant clone, easily detected by conventional TCR analysis, uh, usually done by PCR. Um, that's the strict diagnosis of LGL leukemia in addition to increased numbers of LGL. For aplastic anemia, as a, but also let me tell you that um, if you look at and do sophisticated TCR sequencing um, or do V-beta analysis by TCR phenotyping, uh, you will definitely find one dominant clone in patients with LGL, but you often find uh, other smaller clones. Um, and over time, this is a paper where, again, collaborated with Yarek Masajewski, there's a clonal shift. So as you follow patients for a long time with LGL leukemia, the initial clone will shift to a lower quantity. It's still present, but then there'll be emergence of a more dominant clone over time. Uh, to me, that suggests that this is really an antigen, further evidence that this is an antigen-driven disease and that maybe there's different epitopes being presented over time that uh, results in different um, clonal populations being more or less dominant over time. Yeah, but in aplastic anemia, um, I think it's uh, more an academic exercise. Um, I think there's definitely a tight pathologic connection. Um, to find clonality though, you have to do sophisticated sequencing. So you may not find it um, by just regular TCR sequencing. Um, do you see hypoplastic marrows in LGL patients? So there's a spectrum of marrow findings. Um, in the patient with neutropenia, the classic presentation is a fairly hypercellular marrow with um, so-called maturation arrest, um, where um, there's peripheral destruction of neutrophils um, leading to you know, no late neutrophil precursors in the marrow. Um, there are different degrees of LGL infiltration in the marrow in terms of quantity. There are patients who have a hypoplastic marrows, again, a potential overlap of aplastic anemia. There's generally no correlation between the clinical parameters of low blood counts and to degree, the degree of LGL infiltration. Um, I don't know of any connection to this H SH2D1 mutation. Um, <clears throat> there are some other inherited uh, mutations like GATA2, 
uh, and also a recently described mutation in a toll-like receptor from the work at Ohio State, where um, these are X-linked, so seen only in young males, presenting almost from birth with uh, congenital neutropenia primarily, but also it can be pancytopenia. Um, and uh, oftentimes they have very uh, similar features to LGL leukemia, including like lipoproliferation, autoimmune characteristics like autoimmune hemolyconemias, splenomegaly, uh, LGL-like cells. Sometimes they actually have LGL leukemia by all clinical definition. So um, this is an important point in a young male with um, any kind of bone marrow failure disease that should definitely be worked up for congenital causes with more recent one being a toll-like receptor mutation, T toll-like receptor number eight. Um, treatment options for this case, I think I would go back and treat this patient like aplastic anemia, but add uh, you know, the more current therapy, but it's more than 10 years ago, again, pioneered by Neil Young, of adding ATG, cyc ATG cyclosporin, but adding uh, a plated agonist to that regimen. Um, yeah, so I would definitely consider a patient for a clinical trial. Um, however, um, the trials, as you all know, has specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, the clinical trials that I mentioned for LGL leukemia, this particular patient, and maybe even the first patient, um, without evidence of a documented clone in the blood and a definite LGL increased number in the blood would not be eligible for the trials as they're currently written. Um, and then the last question about transplantation is interesting. And uh, obviously there's not much data there. Um, there are a handful of patients with LGL that have gone on to have a transplant. The biggest retrospective series was published in blood. No, not blood. Um, it was by Thierry Lamy and his colleagues. I think it actually was probably in leukemia. <clears throat> um, where they look back at about 15 patients that had transplants for LGL leukemia, including a mixture of patients who even had auto transplants. And uh, you can't really learn much from a series of you know, 10 or 15 patients. We all know um, that transplantations have their own morbidity and mortality. Um, I will say that these patients who have an LGL related illness and have um, these uh, inherited uh, congenital diseases, um, the transplants are curative for those patients and they tend, out, tend to be really young. So they do well with a transplant. Um, for a patient with aplastic anemia, um, I, would definitely, I would definitely consider a transplant on this particular patient. Dr. Flan, we have been hearing you well. Thank you for your great uh, discussion points. I think uh, it's important to to emphasize the, the uh, intersection between the aplastic and LGL with the T-cell uh, rearrangement problems. That was also shown by UPenn group, how uh, can be used as a marker for, the T-cell rearrangement can be used as a marker for aplastic anemia. So if there is no any other question from the audience, I think we should adjourn here. And uh, we would love to see you guys in our next talk, which is going to be a pure red cell plasia in four weeks. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lafran, uh, and uh, we will uh, stop here.